We're going to be dealing this evening with the time of justification. You say, well, what? Who cares? Oh, oh, you better care because you do a screw up on this, babes, and you screw up your Christian life big time. As you look at your outline, some of you may be surprised that having discussed the nature of justification, that it is a legal verdict in which God declares us not guilty, innocent of all charges, because he takes the righteous life of Christ and he applies it to our account. We looked at the origin of justification. Those who seek to justify themselves are on a fool's errand. Then we looked at the basis of justification, the three building blocks of solidarity, representation and imputation. Then we looked at the means last week, particularly the two Greek words, dia and ek. Then we looked at a whole contrast between regeneration, justification, and sanctification in terms of the attributes of justification. Now we come to the issue of the time of justification. Now, I, I had planned, but you know how we all plan, and it often goes astray, to bring up a box of these little children's toys that my kids had when they little pop-up beads, snap-on beads, or little blocks that you put together. So many of you are so young here, I bet you played. How many of you youths played with beads or little blocks that you could actually pop and then you could make things? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. You're just showing your age. All right? See, back when I was young, all we had were dinosaur bones. We had spears. I mean, we didn't have any you know, pop-up stuff like that. Or you, you got all this. Back when Bishop Acreage, they didn't even have dinosaur bones. He was way back. All he had was rocks. But you see, I was going to bring up a box, and I was going to shake the box, and then I was going to show you disconnected beads. And then you bring a child. And if I brought a little boy, a little girl, and I put them at the table, and I put that box of little beads that you can pop one into the other, and I put it on the table and said, why don't you play with these? How many of you understand within a short period of time they would begin to snap them and they would begin to bring order out of chaos? They would begin to bring meaning. They would take a box of disconnected individual items and by putting them together would make a necklace, a bracelet, put a, make a fort. It's like playing with Lincoln Logs. By the time you're finished, you could have an Indian fort, you could have, or Tinker Toys, or even, um, what was that, uh, the metal stuff we used to put together? Rect erect How many of you had an erector set? Yeah, man, you could make it, steam, shovels. But here's the thing. Part of the image of God within man is the drive to organize. It doesn't matter if we're talking about toys or we're talking about looking at a valley. My father-in-law could look at a valley and a stream and he could figure out that if he could dam that, he could make a lake. So then he would buy all the property as cheap farmland, make a lake, and then sell the property as lakefront property. <laughs> you see, we organize. We can't help but do it. Some of us are so organized, we fold our underwear, and we put our socks into nice convenient, and we put them in our dressers the way they're supposed to be. Those who are more beastful, and the image of God has fled them, just crammed them into the closet. But you see, man at his highest loves order, loves discipline. Why is that? Well, because we read in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33 that our God is not a God of confusion. 
Better to translate it, our God is not a God of chaos. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. God is not a God of chaos, but of order, harmony, in which things are not in a chaotic state. It's like the time a Pentecostal, a Presbyterian, and a Baptist were worshiping the Lord. And the old furnace exploded and there was a puff of smoke that came up through the floor of the church. Ba-boom! And the Pentecostal jumped up. Fire! Fire! The Baptist jumped up. Water! Water! And the Presbyterian said, Order! Order! When you study Genesis chapter 1, what is God doing? Organizing the universe. He separated this from that. He created this. He, he organized the universe so that the universe that confronts us is an orderly universe governed by laws. And who do you think put the laws there? It's like someone says, well, I believe everything is relative. I said, come up on the roof with me. <laughs> There's no law of gravity, right? No absolute, so come up on the roof. Let's go. Come on, show me. Everything's relative. No, we live in a universe that really doesn't care what you believe. You can be an idiot, like, Ella, like well, you can take Mary Baker, Eddie Clover Patterson, who started Christian Science, who said there is no such thing as pain and death. But she'd be dead. <laughs> See what I mean? She dead, she dead. You see, reality doesn't care what you believe. Reality is going to function in an orderly way. Thus, it is no surprise that Christianity at its best organizes its doctrines, its ideas, and its principles in a systematic form. Systematic theology today is viewed as the enemy, as something evil. Well, Dr. Morey uh, is too deep and too detailed, one man told me. He wants to cram systematic theology down people. Let people alone just love Jesus. <laughs> and you see, what we're dealing with today is that people being confused about their theology is piety. People holding contradictory ideas is somehow holiness. And the idea that we should organize what we believe and look at Scripture to see the order that is there escapes the modern Christian. We're told we just preach the gospel. I remember one pastor came to visit me and he said, well, we just preach the gospel at our church. We know you don't. Now, what did he mean by that? What he simply meant is that he preaches and teaches that people need to be saved and he doesn't go any further. You come year after year and it's always the same sermon. And it's disorganized at that. Well, I believe that in order to reflect the image of God within man, you have to care about such things as justification to look at the nature of it, the origin, basis, means, attributes, time, effects, and evidence. But why? Because this is what the Bible does. It's the image of God within man. We're not to be baboons. But we live in a day and age in which the call to be systematic in your theology is viewed as outmoded, evil, cold, non-spiritual, and the more chaotic you are, the more confused you are, somehow that means you're more godly. But I do not find this so in Scripture. Now, do we find the Bible putting the elements of salvation called the ordo salutis, the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. Does the Bible, the authors of Scripture, 
treat the elements of salvation by putting them in specific orders that we're supposed to notice. That is, this duck should follow this duck, which follows. Do they put the ducks in order? Or is it a massive confusion of Holy Ghost and just, oh, what praying Jesus and just confused? Well, if you turn with me for an example to Romans chapter 8, and this is only one passage, you will find that Christianity at its best reflects the image of God by putting things in the right order. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28 for the context. And those of you who have a good translation, verse 28 will have a paragraph symbol or 28 will be in bold. How many of you have some indication that verse 28 is something new? You've got to pay attention to the details. And we know that God is causing all things to work together for good to every human being on the planet. Now you see, those who teach positive thinking tell unbelievers, oh, don't worry, everything will work out for the best. <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. See, when a Christian tells a non-Christian, don't worry, God will work everything out for the good, they're lying. Because what God has in plan for someone who does not bow to Jesus Christ does not fit the definition of good. God is actively causing all things to work together for the good to those who want. That means it's not everybody. You just can't go out there to the world and say, oh, don't worry, there's a purpose. Everything will turn out. No, there isn't a silver lining for some people. There's a dark lining of the wrath and judgment of God. He says, now look, God is causing all these things for those who love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. If you want to know, the goal of salvation is that you will be conformed to the moral character of Jesus Christ, not his physical image. There have been some nimnus in history who taught there will be no women in heaven. That once you are saved at the resurrection, we all become males. Because Jesus was what? A man? So the women must be... And see, that's the idiocy we face in churches. It's not talking about a physical image where the women have vacated the... And the proof, you know, they have there are no women in heaven. It says there was silence for the space of 30 minutes. And if there was one there, they knew she would have said something. It's the moral character of Jesus Christ. We're to be conformed to his character. But listen to what he says, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, these whom he predestined, then he did what? Call. Those whom he called, he did what? Justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. Is there not what is called the golden chain of Romans 8? Are the ducks put in a specific order in this passage. Now, if you put glorification in the wrong place, that's what sinless perfectionism does. That's what the blab it, grab it, name it, claim it people do. Glorification. Well, what is this glorification? Well, if you look further back, he talks about that in verse 17. If we suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the what? That is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, 
in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the what? Of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. He's speaking of the resurrection of the body when we will be rendered immortal and incorruptible. No more pain, no more tears, no more arthritis, no need for Advil. Glorification means when God vindicates his people as being his people. We shall be revealed as the children of God. And the creation itself will be set free. Now, do we get that now? No. Those people who say you need never die. When do you get the never die part of salvation? At glorification, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23, he will sanctify you wholly, body, soul, and spirit, at the coming of Christ. Well, I want it now. <laughs> Fine, honey, there's a lot of you before. Look, we've been having 2,000 years of Christianity. Nobody's still alive. You may claim, I don't have to die. I'm getting it now. The only thing you're going to get is the worm. That's it. Now, the point is this. There, these elements, predestination, calling, justification, glorification, are they put in a meaningful order or was just this a random crap game of the apostle Paul? <laughs> Let it go. Oh, oh, put it there. Tyler, call him. We're going to put Oh, put it. <clears throat> did he organize the Ordo Salutis? Yes, he did. Did he begin with eternity past? Yes, he did. And he ended with eternity. It anchors in eternity past in the decrees of God and ends in eternity future when we are glorified with immortal and incorruptible bodies in the eternal state. What comes in between, he lays out. Now, there are other elements of salvation that he mentions elsewhere and puts them in the right order. Adoption. <clears throat> For example, there is a big difference between being a forgiven sinner and an adopted child of God. If you had someone break into your home and steal a television, and he gets caught, and you tell him, I forgive you, does that mean he's a member of your family? Adoption is that work of God's grace where he takes forgiven, justified sinners into his family and adopts them as his own children and makes them heirs with Christ heirs of the universe. Look around you. This world belongs to us. And you see, in theology, adoption comes after justification. Because once God is declared us not guilty, we're righteous because Christ's righteousness is put to our account. And we are innocent of all charges. He has no problem having us in his home and saying, I'm adopting you to be a king's kid. Therefore, in theology, does adoption come after justification or before justification? Justification is the legal basis of adoption. And you see, all the other elements of salvation can be arranged according to the divine order, if you have your wits about you and you notice what the Bible is saying. Now, for example, we're dealing here in Romans 8 with the golden chain that begins in eternity and ends in eternity. 
Now notice what comes before justification. What is it? Calling. You say, calling? What is calling? Oh, it's very specific in Scripture. Theologians develop the word conversion as the catchphrase for what calling is all about. God calls us to repentance. So in calling is repentance. We're not only called to repent of our sins, we're also called to do what? Believe. Repentance and faith are two doctrines that are in the circle of calling. So that God calls us, as Paul put it in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. He said, when I was with you, I preached repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. If you ever want a summary of the gospel, it's in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21. Because repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You can mention one without the other, for the one implies the other. So Acts 2.38 says repent, but it doesn't say believe. John 3.16 says believe, but it doesn't say repent. Now, of course, there are the idiots who develop a whole theology where you don't preach repentance because it's not mentioned in John 3.16. But watch this. Repentance in the Greek metanoia means to turn away from. Faith means to turn toward. When I turn from my sin to the Savior, I'm actually doing two actions. I'm turning from and turning to. Repentance is turning away from sin. Faith is turning to Jesus Christ. You cannot turn to Christ without turning away. And when you turn away, you're turning to Christ. That's why repentance and faith constitute the fruit of God's call. Come, ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded by the fall. So that calling comes before justification because faith precedes justification. Repentance precedes justification. Justification does not happen before calling. Look at the text. He said, oh, what are you getting at? Well, bear with me for a moment. How many of you have ever heard of the theological party called the antinomians? It comes from anti and nomos, the Greek word for law. An antinomian, and we have plenty of them today, believe that we don't have to be serious about sin. That you can be a Christian and commit adultery, you can be a Christian and do whatever you want because you're forgiven. I often would hear it in counseling. Well, I remember this one woman comes to mind. She said, well, if I do sleep with him, I know God will forgive me anyway. And the antinomians actually had a theological party. And they were called the antinomians. They were called the libertines. And this is what they taught. Justification takes place in eternity. You are born justified and forgiven. There is no need for conversion. There is no need for repentance and faith. Because you are justified from all eternity. And as you are born, you're born forgiven. And all the sins that you will do in the future, well, they really don't count anyway. So they live like the devil. He said, wow, people actually, yeah, they lived that way. And they were a scourge in the theological world. And today we have a lot of people who think that way. Why? They took justification, which we see in the text as after calling, and put it over with predestination in eternity past. 
or they put it at the death of Christ on the cross. We were justified when Jesus died on the cross. So we are born forgiven. Freed from the law, oh happy condition, now I can sin and still have remission. But you see, not only does Romans 8 not put justification in eternity, puts it after calling, which takes place in the space-time continuum, but also if you use Venn diagrams, and if I had an overhead here, I was going to draw a circle and write the word justification, and then I'd have some pieces of plastic, one that says eternity, one that says the death of Christ, one that says faith, and I will say, where does the New Testament make these circles intersect? Is there a single verse that says we are justified in eternity? No. Is there a single verse that says we were justified when Christ died on the cross? No. But are there verses to indicate that we are justified after we believe? that it is by faith that, yes, it is, because if you look there in Romans chapter 3, verse 30, God will justify the circumcised ek pestuos. Out of his faith comes his justification. It's the word ek, meaning out of. And the uncircumcised Dia, D-I-A, through the means of pestuos. So that what comes first before justification? Faith. 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 We are justified out of our faith, through faith, which is what calling is all about. Now the antinomian, you see, really has no biblical basis whatsoever in which to demonstrate his position but some confusion. And that's mainly bad theology is because someone is confused in the brain. Justification takes place in heaven, not on earth. It is done by God the Father, not by us. It is in the context or what's called the theological model of a courtroom scene. God is the judge and we're the guilty sinner. It comprises the fact that Jesus Christ takes our police record and writes his name on it so it becomes his police record. And we get his police record, which was clean, not a single crime, not even, not even running a red light. So that we get his righteousness and he gets our sin so he dies under the wrath of God and we become in God's eyes righteous not guilty innocent of all charges and it's in the context of a courtroom scene in heaven and justification is the legal verdict not guilty innocent of all charges that justification is the act of God which we receive through faith. Are we ever told that it is through baptism, which is the Roman Catholic position? No. Through works? No. By our? Oh, no. Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by what? Faith. What do we have as a result of this act of justification in which God declares us not guilty, but Christ guilty? He gets the guilty verdict. He goes to hell on the cross so that we can go to heaven. What happens? We have what? Peace, peace of soul, no, peace of mind, peace, with, peace of God. Notice details. Peace with God is objective, it's not emotional, has nothing to do with your feelings. 
It means that through justification, the war between us and God is over. And then comes shouting time. Because he is no longer our enemy and we are no longer his enemy. You cannot look to church membership, to baptism. You cannot look to anything other than faith alone, apart from the works of the law, as the means by which we receive the sovereign, free grace of justification. It doesn't take place in eternity. He's confusing election and justification. Doesn't even take place at the cross. He's confusing justification with expiation. That's why I spent 300 pages in my book on the atonement saying, this is what propitiation means. This is what expiation means. This is what adoption means. Trying to define these things in such a way that you understand that the word saved is pregnant with meaning. See how quickly fundamentalists say, are you saved, brother? I was saved. What does it mean to be saved? What it means, it starts in eternity past. God chose, elected, predestination. It means in history that Christ died for our sins. It means justification. It means regeneration. It means calling. It means all of these things. Just like a woman is her belly, she's ready to pop. I mean, she got twins or quintuplets. The word saved is pregnant with these different words. And if you don't know the difference between propitiation, expiation, regeneration, justification, sanctification, if you don't know, you have robbed.